Yeah, that's gonna be too loud. Yeah, I'm kind of a sucker for merch, and I really had to restrain myself as theaters appear to be branching out into merchandising as a way to compensate for movies sucking and not bringing in audiences. Among the many items they were selling was this green caramel popcorn, which tastes like caramel popcorn. That's pretty good. Why am I eating during a video? Oh my god. They had cool metal popcorn tins that would make great garbage cans, cups, special edition ghost traps filled with popcorn, posters, even t-shirts. It's like visiting the merch booth before a concert, uh, onto the movie. Yes, dear. Insert usual spoilers boilerplate here. The first movie was obvious perfection, the definition of lightning in a bottle. This is kind of reinforced by the fact that they made a sequel five years later with the same cast and crew, but while decent, it just wasn't quite the same. Speaking of the second movie, when Afterlife was first teased, much was made about how even the teaser trailer apparently decanonized the second movie. But they didn't show anything. Ah, but they showed just enough, though that brief glimpse of the car under the tarp revealed this. Uh, so? In Ghostbusters 2, the Ecto-1 had the brand new white Statue of Liberty plates. These orange plates were gone. On top of that, the new plates were a major plot point, as that was what inspired the boys to use the Statue of Liberty. Something good, something decent, something pure. So then, when Afterlife finally came out, there was no mention of the events in 1989, reinforcing the belief that they were trying to decanonize the second movie. If they were, I'm not sure why, as it really didn't help or fix anything that needed to be fixed. Like the sequel trilogy? Right, you are, Doge. But I'm pleased to announce that near the beginning of Frozen Empire, they reaffirmed Ghostbusters 2 as canon. Now let's get right into the meat of this. Obviously, right off the bat, this is one of those movies that we desperately want to like. We want to see succeed. Like the sequel trilogy? Quiet you. I enjoyed the movie overall for the most part, but I really felt like I was watching the first draft of the script. Everything was very unpolished, very unrefined. The pacing was way off. There were points in the movie where it felt like the script just said, Camille, Bill Murray, and Bill Rudd will just ad-lib something funny here. On screen, it looked like they were under the gun, like unprepared, especially Camille and Rudd, where the director started rolling and just said, be funny. It really felt like they were struggling, and the result often came off empty and cringe. And definitely not funny. But most of all, there were way too many people in this movie. People who didn't need to be there. Patton Oswalt is a perfect example. As the expert, Ray should have been the source of the information that they needed, and it would have beefed up his role. He should be the new gang's Obi-Wan. But they needlessly gave it to someone else. I feel like that entire sequence only existed to get them to the library so the Possessor Ghost could animate the lion. Finn's girlfriend, Lucky, didn't need to be there at all. In fact, I thought she was going to die based on this scene from the trailer. Oh, tear ducts freezing up. A scene that's not in the movie. And then there's this scene. Descendants of Egon Spank. Not in the movie. And then there's this scene. <laughs> Not in the movie. And then there's this scene. Ghostbusters, what do you want? And then there's this scene. The trailer practically promised an entirely different movie. Release the Reitman cut. No, <laughs> I'm not expecting any kind of director's cut. The trailers also teased that the big bad was going to be more of a threat than he actually ended up being. Instead, it was super easy, barely an inconvenience. So less of a gozer and more of a Vigo. Exactly. Hey, did you know that Vigo the Carpathian was in Die Hard? That's cool. It also would have been really awesome to have a Vigo cameo when all the ghosts escape from the containment system. I'm glad you brought that up. Let's address that for a moment. Earlier, it's established that the containment system is in danger of collapse. Then Finn discovers Slimer in the attic of the firehouse. And Ray sees the librarian in the New York City library. It should have been brought up that they were actually leaking ghosts already, but no one addresses it. Again, it feels like this film got cut up. That's one of the problems that are created when you have too 
many threads going on, compounded by too many characters in the story, each demanding their own narrative purpose. As a consequence, the third act lacked a lot of weight. Paul Rudd and Carrie Coon's relationship didn't get the satisfying ending it needed. Finn and his girlfriend had basically been forgotten since Act 1, although they let him drive the Ecto at the end. Whoopee. The Firemaster's arc was kind of unearned, considering the skill level he needed to get to in such a short period of time. Regular Joe to Firebender in just minutes. Talk about not getting a growth arc. Yes, way overcomplicated for the story. The Keymaster and the Gatekeeper had a much simpler task. Daddy you now. <laughs> Podcast, Venk Ray, Janine, Winston, we're all just kind of there. Phoebe and Paul Rudd got their arc fulfilled, I thought, and just like Afterlife, Phoebe is the heart of this picture. But it just wasn't the same. It was still giving me those first draft vibes. The spark she seemed to have before was gone. Because of this new situation she's in, she's in a lot darker place, obviously, and there's a part of me that wants to just chalk it up to her going through her teenage years as well. But there's a point in the movie where she gets really aggressive against her mother, and it just seemed way out of character for her tonally. There are some out there who are saying that her entire arc with the other ghost was... Uh, excuse me. Um, what's the word for it? I believe I asked you to put a chicken in. And I'm sad to say that for a brief moment, the same thought crossed my mind. But it brings up what I think is an important point. We've been abused with the message for so long that we can't help but flinch, even if what's happening is completely innocent. And in this case, I think it is completely innocent. She was just a lonely girl, desperate to connect with someone in a meaningful way, even if it's the afterlife. Because at this point in the story, she felt she couldn't trust her family to fulfill that role for her. The real issue was that the Phoebe Melody arc was kind of lazy writing. It was awkward, a bit cringe, and utterly predictable that Melody would betray Phoebe. While it did have its closure at the end, it was a tired trope that didn't need to be in the movie. They could have done something else, something new, something that would have added to Phoebe's character growth. For example, even piggybacking on their idea they actually could have explored something meaningful, like really having to struggle with the ethical side of being a Ghostbuster. That's what I thought they were going to do. Right. Up until Egon, the ghosts have all been these bizarre caricatures, which makes the idea of trapping them and putting them into containment a no-brainer. But we forget that most of these ghosts were real people at one point, and Phoebe's choosing to separate her spirit from her body for two minutes was totally out of character for her. It was completely dangerous with unknown consequences, and the payoff for her doing it? There was no motivation in any potential payoff. It didn't make sense. Even for two minutes, it was lame. It would have been much simpler to just trick her into reading the words from a sacred text or something like that. I get why Jason Reitman passed off the directing duties because he wants to do his own things, but it's like he wasn't overseeing this at all. If it hadn't been for the writer strike already delaying the release of this film, I would have said it was Sony shoving it out the door before it was ready to make up some revenue from Madam Web. Get out your proton packs, it's, it's Morbid time! time. <laughs> While it may sound like I'm trashing the ectoplasm out of this film, I'm really not. While the pacing was off and it had the issues I mentioned, I still enjoyed the film. I'm just saying it could have been better. And hey, maybe we'll get lucky and get that director's cut. There's obviously a lot they left on the floor. But what did you guys think? Flame the comments below and stay fresh, cheese bags.